share my screen and, and get started. And uh, you'll... I, I record it. Oh, you'll record it, yeah. And I'll do share screen now. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? I think I think you just heard me, uh, Professor Pan, right? Okay, I'll assume everything's good to go and I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so uh, welcome back everybody for this final lecture in this Hill Slope Hydrology class. Uh, as we've done through the last three lectures, we started off talking about the evolution of our perceptual models of runoff generation mechanisms, uh, starting with the work of Horton in the early 30s and going up until the start of the first international uh, hydrological decade and, and its end in 1974. We then talked about how stable isotope tracers really resulted in a, something of a paradigm shift in terms of thinking of now rather than rainfall making its way through the hill slope and into the stream. The rainfall is really a trigger for displacement or release of stored water, water in the hill slope prior to the event. Uh, then we went through last week some of the kind of current concepts of runoff generation, striking similarities as we saw existing between overland flow and subsurface storm flow. And we talked about how the hill slope relates to other geomorphic positions in the catchment for. Uh, the generation of runoff at catchment scales or even larger watershed scales up to maybe 100 square kilometers. <clears throat> Today is our last lecture and we're going to talk about hill slope hydrology when it's not raining. So everything so far has been about what goes on when it rains or when the snow melts. Today is what happens in between those events and how can that help us in our understanding of our three main questions flow source, flow path, and flow time or, or travel time. And uh, we're gonna start off, of course, with that last one, this idea of travel time, transit time, and I'll try to make some of those definitions as we go. So this is uh, the, the roadmap then for today. Uh, we're gonna start with transit time of water, uh, using stable isotopes, again, as a tracer, and then we'll talk about vegetation water sources, where do plants get their water? Same kind of questions we ask of a catchment or a hill slope, we can ask of a tree, for instance, and we'll, we'll do that uh, today. So this is the structure of uh, this final lecture, these two, uh, two main sections. And don't forget that we're, we're using the stable isotope approach now that we've talked about quite a bit, but we're going to be comparing and contrasting this uh, calculation of transit time. What's the, how is that signal on the left damped and lagged to form the string signal on the right? And of course that amount of damping and lagging is really a function of the transit time. And remember we talked very simply if the right hand uh, graph looked the same as the left hand graph, that would just mean that everything moved as overland flow, nothing infiltrated like a parking lot. And if it was a flat line on the right, we would just say that everything went in into some infinitely deep sand tank. But uh, as we've talked about already, usually it's somewhere in between and the catchment is filtering these inputs. And it's that filtering we're wanting to use to calculate the, the transit time. And as you can see already in this diagram, it's not just one transit time, it's a whole distribution of transit times. So for instance, if I get my cursor to work, if a, if a raindrop falls on the stream or near the stream, then it's, it's transit time to the, to the outflow is very short. But if something falls near the watershed divide and goes very deep, maybe even into the bedrock and then up, appears again in the stream, you know, that could take, uh, a long time, years, decades, centuries, or even longer. So it's that blend that we're trying to uh, think about tonight. 
And then we'll talk about the, the other uh, exit from the watershed, of course, very important to our water balance. Many areas in China, what goes out through evapotranspiration is quite a bit greater even than the outflow from the catchment water balance or the from the outflow in terms of stream flow as part of the catchment water balance. So this is what we'll, we'll focus on. Okay, transit time or mean transit time. We'll, we're gonna first think about what are some definitions we're going to use to uh, talk about these words. And let's talk about uh, catchment transit time. It's really an elapsed time, as you can see in this equation, Tw equal T out minus T in. Uh, the elapsed time from the input of water through the system input boundary, that's just a fancy way of saying the, the, uh, the surface of the catchment, at time T in to the output of that water through a system output boundary at time T out. And of course the output boundary is the stream. And in our small watersheds, the travel time through the stream is very short. So we don't worry about the transit time as uh, the kinematics of flow through the river because these are small headwater systems. So we're really focused on the, the, the filtering that goes on that we talked about before. So we take this input and we're trying to pass it through some kind of mathematical function to give us the, the output. So we measure the input, of course, with our isotope sampling of rainfall, like you saw in, uh, in lecture uh, two. And we measure the concentration or the isotope composition of the stream water. And what we're doing is trying to convolve the input with a, a response function, a, a so-called transit time distribution function, to give us a, a really a best fit to that outflow. And that, that process will enable us to get at uh, the transit time and the mean transit time. So let's keep going and thinking about what this might mean physically. So we're talking about hill slopes. And uh, just look at the upper left-hand uh, panel here. And again, hope, hopefully you can see my, uh, my laser pointer. So we have an input to this part of the hill slope, and on this idealized hill slope, water starts to move laterally down slope. So there's the input that's falling on this portion of the hill slope that's moving down slope. Now by the time <clears throat> the water that was added here makes its way to this mid-slope position, you can see what's happened in blue here. It's, it's become smeared, smeared. There's been advective, dispersive mixing, and now things are, are, are smearing, just like you might imagine, uh, I don't know, a puff of smoke in the air. It's, there's dispersive mixing, diffusion as it moves down slope. And by the time you get to the base of the slope, now that blue input is really stretched out. And we can do this then to the rain input across the whole hill slope. A mid-slope input gets smeared here. A near stream input, uh, it doesn't really get smeared because it quickly gets into the stream. So when you take all of these inputs, what does it look like? It looks like an exponential distribution. And what is an exponential distribution? It's simply a, a function that says, well, we got lots of short flow paths and we got some long flow paths, <clears throat> like a long tail of the distribution. And this exponential is probably for much of the literature up until about 2000 or so, explained the, the transit time distribution function meaning that thing in the middle here, this TTD, would be an exponential. So you convolve or blend the stream signal with an exponential distribution, and you get a best fit on this output line. And once you get the best fit, you take the mean of that distribution, the mean of the distribution, and that gives you the mean transit time. So I'm starting this in a very qualitative descriptive way, uh, let's look at it, uh, well, 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 we'll look at it mathematically in just a minute. Let's look at an example uh, to start with. So here again, we've got the catchment uh, cartoon you've seen many times. We're going to go to this watershed. This is in the northwest United States in Oregon. We've talked about this watershed already, the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest. And we're going to blend or convolve the input signal 
with a transit time distribution function to give us the best fit here. Now, we've been talking about exponentials that look kind of like this that I'm drawing with my cursor, but of course there are many different functions we could use. And depending on the kind of hill slope or catchment you have, it could be a dispersion model or two parallel linear reservoirs or a Dirac function. There's names for all these many, many, many different functions shown in red. But we're going to assume for this example that we're going to have an exponential distribution. That's the one that we're going to pick from here. And then we pass the input through this exponential to give us the best fit. So if we look at field data, then this is what we do. We take uh, samples from the stream, and these are the samples uh, in the green dots. On the y-axis is the oxygen 18 composition in per mil. Remember, you know that, uh, that term and unit now, per mil is parts per thousand. Uh, remember, this is the uh, stable isotope of oxygen, O18. And here's a, a time series of about uh, two years or so. So these green dots, uh, my PhD student, Kevin McGuire, he's gone to the stream and taken uh, samples. We've analyzed them in the lab. And now this faint kind of gray line is that best fit line through that convolution, meaning this is what we did. We convolved the input with an exponential to give us the best fit. And that gray line now is that best fit. And if you take the mean of that distribution, meaning if we go back to our distribution and we uh, look at the residence time, the mean of that uh, residence time, transit time distribution in this particular case is 2.2 years. So we'd say that's the mean transit time distribution for, or mean transit time, I should say, for water in the stream at this catchment. Let me try to, uh, and stop me if you have any questions at all, uh, let me try and show you another way. Uh, very simple mathematical expression. Here, the predicted stream flow signature using this simple method is equal to the input function, which is just that uh, derived from the precipitation signal, uh, times this system response function that I said was an exponential. So again, if we go back to our diagrams, this is the system response function, this is the input function, and then this is the output function that we're, we're modeling. So it's called the convolution integral. And I'd say up until, again, maybe 2000, maybe 2010, it was the, the method that had been used for quite some time. We'll talk later about newer methods and what this might mean for our field. So let's go back to this catchment now and perform this, not just for one stream, but a whole bunch of streams. So the beauty of this, this site, I think you've already seen a picture of it, the H.J. Andrews, it's about 60 square kilometers. And within that larger watershed are smaller watersheds on the order of, there's one that's 580 hectares. These are roughly one square kilometer. These are, uh, this is a 10 hectare watershed. And we can sample the stream water for all these watersheds and then apply this method. And we're doing this because not only do we want to know how old the water is in the stream, but we want to learn something about how these hill slopes and catchments process their inputs. And we're going to hypothesize that, or, or pose the hypothesis, or test the hypothesis, that the water in the stream should probably get older as we go to larger and larger watershed scales. Meaning, as you accumulate more and more of that filtering potential in the landscape, we might think that the water then would get more damped and lagged or older. That's what we're going to first look at here. So here are all those streams. Again, 018 on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. You already saw this one in the lower uh, panel. This is the dots in green for this watershed. Don't worry about the numbers. These are all just the watershed numbering. Uh, this is that 10 hectare watershed. But what you can see in this column here are the effectively the ages, the mean transit times for these different streams. And they're varying from about uh, 0.8 years to just over three years. So this is a bit uh, maybe surprising that uh, the water is that old. 
especially if you're coming at this from the kind of pre-isotope mindset. Uh, but what we know now about the differences between celerity and velocity, uh, this is really not that surprising. Uh, remember the, the kind of paradox we talked about in lecture two, uh, hill slopes are storing water for months or years, but releasing it in minutes or hours to the stream channel. And this is the, the age of that water that they're, they're releasing. But the question is, does the water in the stream get old, older as you go to larger and larger catchment scales? So here are the data. Uh, again, this is the mean transit time on the y-axis. Uh, again, at range from just under one year to just over three years. And here's the range of scales on the x-axis going from about 10 hectares to about 60 square kilometers. And what we see is there's just no relationship with area. Uh, these, these residence times don't scale with watershed area. And this surprised us when we first uh, published this information. And what surprised us more was that when we hunted them to uh, kind of come up with metrics that could explain those ages or transit times, what we found was that the aspects of the slope, the length, the gradient, together could explain a lot of the variance of, of the transit time, over 90%, just the slope length divided by the slope gradient. So for catchments that had steep, short slopes, they had very short residence times. And those catchments that had very long, gentle slopes, they had, long, they had much longer transit time. So that is something we learned a lot about in this catchment using isotopes and many groups around the world have been looking at similar things and this is information you wouldn't ascertain or get from stream flow signals from hydrographs and that's another value of this this kind of tracer technique now let's compare the site we just looked at which is here in the in that small circle uh, this is uh, looking in a google earth image uh, again, we're in Oregon, just north of California, on the, the west coast. That's the Pacific Ocean there on the left. And uh, this is a volcanic landscape, as you can see. You know, one famous volcano, Mount St. Helens, that uh, blew in the early 1980s, you might have heard of. Now we're going to slide over from this volcanic landscape we've just looked at to these catchments here in the coast range. Uh, it, very similar uh, rainfall inputs per year, very similar uh, soil thickness, uh, very similar vegetation. They're both Douglas fir trees that are grown uh, for forestry. The difference here is that the geology is, is different. Now we've gone from these volcanic breaches and other kind of tight volcanic rocks to these are metamorphosed sediments like sandstone, mudstones, and more permeable. So we're gonna now see whether or not what we looked at over here, these relationships, these ages and these uh, scaling behaviors, are they the same over here where the rainfall runoff response is effectively the same? And just to show you that the rainfall runoff response is very similar, here's the catchment that we've already been looking at. This is one, two, three, four years of data along the x-axis. This is discharge on the y-axis and here's precipitation. So you see it's a wet, a wet place over 2,000 millimeters per year uh, of precipitation. There's a wet season and then a long dry season, wet season, dry season. And at the catchments that we're going to go to now, uh, again, very similar. Look at the units here, very similar in terms of millimeters per hour, in terms of runoff response for these years, wet, uh, uh, flashy hydrographs. There's not a lot you can see that's different here. Uh, let's look at uh, this in log scale. So this was just an arithmetic scale uh, for the discharge on the y-axis. Let's look at these same data, but now we look at a log scale for runoff where we can see maybe there are some differences in low flow that would be uh, able to be seen in a semi-log graph like this because now you, you, uh, you increase the the, the resolution, if you like, of the low flow. But even there, we see very striking similarities between these, uh, these catchments. And if you look at these years here, uh, 2006, 
uh, precipitation for that hydrologic year, 2389 millimeters here, 2214. Over here, 2278, 2297. I mean, they're almost within like an inch of uh, rainfall. They're very, very similar. So the rainfall runoff behavior is almost identical. What about the transit time and the scaling of those transit times? So here we have, uh, just like the site here, I'm not gonna show you too many pictures, but we have about eight watersheds that are gauged and they vary in size from about five hectares to roughly 100 square kilometers. And what do we find? We found the exact opposite. Here, there was no relationship with these slope measurements like the gradient or the length, but this thing we thought that would operate in this first volcanic set of catchments here is working meaning controlling the relationship between mean transit time on the y-axis and catchment area. So this is saying that about 80 to 80, 84% of the variance of the transit time differences between these eight watersheds can be explained by area, the opposite of the other watershed. Also here, the ranges range from about three to 11 years, so much older. Why is that? Think about that for the question period. It's older water, why is that? And it's scaling with basin area, not with the terrain measures. Try to think about what might be going on there. And we'll, 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 uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Let me tell you our thoughts as it relates to this, uh, this comparison. The Coast Range site, the one that we're looking at now, which uh, has similar rainfall runoff response, but very different ages and, and uh, scaling. Again, it's this deep permeable rock. These are these alternating layers of sandstone and mudstone, meaning it's quite a big sponge relative to the other landscape. So we've drilled a lot of holes into these catchments and we've looked at some of the ages with other tracer techniques like tritium. And what we found is that, yeah, as you go downstream, in this kind of cartoon, that water in the streams getting older, and it's because the water is going deeper, and these longer, deeper flow paths are emerging in the stream. So it's a different sort of plumbing, but you would never have known that with the rainfall runoff response. And that's, I think, uh, been a real uh, value of these tracers for what goes on in between runoff events. So now we're, again, we're scaling out to look at things over much larger periods of time uh, outside of individual rainfall events. I guess that's what I mean. So to compare these sites, this is that one in the volcanic area, the H.D. Andrews that I started with. Things seem to be moving laterally through soil or subsoil, but above the bedrock. That's <clears throat> maybe not fully impermeable, but, it, impermeable, but it's, uh, it's quite poorly permeable. Whereas over in this coast range, things aren't being forced laterally so much because things water is going in and mixing with uh, a lot of stored water, and then the relationship with area expresses itself uh, that way. So despite similar forms, despite similar runoff behavior, the very different types of hill slope or watershed storage and release. Let's look at one last example before we go on to the plants. And this is from a place where I spent my sabbatical last year uh, in 2019, living in this uh, lovely town of Luxembourg. And Luxembourg, of course, is a country as well and has a, really an amazing uh, network of instrumented watersheds. And we're gonna look at them here. So here you're seeing, I think there are 16 watersheds uh, gauged. This is by colleagues uh, in Luxembourg, led by someone named Laurent Pfister. And these watersheds are, uh, are experimental catchments on different rock types. And these colors represent different rock types. Sandstone, mudstone, marl, schist. These are all names for different rocks. And those rocks all have different permeability, just like the example I gave you from uh, the United States a few minutes ago. And Laurent led this beautiful study where he looked at the relationship then between mean transit time, again on the y-axis, and this is the permeability of that rock. So the places with uh, 
very high permeability, have very long transit times, and the places with low permeability have low transit time. And the size of those dots just represents the annual flow of streams that were sampled. So each dot's a different uh, watershed outflow that was sampled. And we did all of that um, kind of manipulation of the tracer data to come up with a mean transit time estimation. So what this is saying is that really it comes down to the nature of the sponge, meaning the, the rock type and how permeable it is and how much it can store and release. And if it's very poorly permeable, then th it can force things to go laterally. But if it has permeability, it absorbs it and then slowly releases it to the streams over time. So this has been, uh, uh, I think, an interesting uh, finding for many groups working in different areas. Let's look at the second question. Where do trees get their water? Uh, and it's, in a way, it's kind of the other boundary condition. We've talked about geology being the subsurface boundary condition and the permeability of that rock type. Now we're looking at the other boundary, that is the, the vegetation on the soil surface. So again, we're looking at boundary conditions. We've just talked about this lower boundary. Now we're going to talk about the upper boundary with vegetation. This is what we're going to focus on. And the question is, where do trees get their water? And is that subsurface well mixed? Are they using uh, the same water that we might see in the stream or in, uh, or in soil or groundwater. And we're going to explore those questions by sampling the, the tree, just like we sample the stream. Now, of course, we can't dip a water bottle into the tree, but you can t drill a little hole to sample the xylem water. This is the moving water through the, the living tissue of the plant. And this is the, the, the kind of the highway for water moving from the roots to the leaves or needles. And if you sample the water in the, in the trunk of the tree or on some of the branches, you can actually say something about the source water, where it's getting their wa its water from the root network. And uh, that's what we're going to look at. Uh, and I'll make reference to a, a couple of papers that we've published in recent years on this. Okay, so we're going to sample the tree and we're going to use something called uh, extraction to get the water out of that living tissue. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And there was work done on this, uh, you know, back in late 80s, early 90s. This was a lovely paper in Nature by Dawson and Elringer. Uh, Todd Dawson's a prof at UC Berkeley and Jim Elringer is just retired from the University of Utah. And they looked at the, the hydrogen isotope. Remember, this is deuterium, 2H. And that's on the y-axis. On the x-axis is tree diameter. So they looked at some small trees, three different tree species, some small trees, and then larger trees. And look what happened isotopically. The small trees were using water that looked like precipitation isotopically. The big trees looked like groundwater. and that transition happened when they got to be a certain size or age. So the isotopes, and the reason why this was such an important paper, the isotope showed something that it would be very difficult to quantify in any other way. The shift in water sources as the trees uh, change from small to large or young to old. But the one thing to take notice of is that prior to about 2009 or 10 years ago, these studies all use one or the other isotope, meaning O18 or deuterium. And what I want to talk about now is how we can use both isotopes together. We've not really done that yet, but let's look at what a plot of that might look like. And now we're looking at plants. I just want you to orient yourself to this kind of plot, this kind of bivariate plot, uh, and think about what this means. So remember, we've looked at this. Uh, this diagram a lot now, and the rainfall is quite sinusoidal, going up and down, up and down over, year, over many years. The light or negative signal is in the winter time. The heavy closer to zero is in the summertime, and so you're seeing seasonal variations in the input. 
we see that if we plot O18 versus deuterium. But rather than going up and down in a sine wave, it goes up and down this thing called the meteoric waterline. So there's summer, there's winter, and it, it just moves along this line. Similarly, if we sample soil water or stream water, just like stream water here is a lagged and damp version of the input, here, stream water again, lagged and damped relative to this input that's covering a much wider uh, amplitude. So why I'm showing you this is that prior to maybe 2010 or so, every catchment where I worked from this site in Mexico, which was in a tropical cloud forest, to watersheds in Oregon or other parts of the US or New Zealand or Japan, all the systems that I'd worked in, the data looked like this. They fell on this meteoric waterline and showed the same kind of damping, lagging as we go from rainfall to soil water to stream flow and then groundwater would be even more damped. The reason why I'm showing you this is that if we were to get any samples that plotted off this line, meaning above it or below it, that would be a telltale sign of a, a fractionation process that would tell us something physically. So above the line would be a telltale sign of condensation, and below the line would be a telltale sign of evaporation. So if we had my uh, water cup and we left it in this dry room for a couple of days, maybe some of the water would be evaporated, and just like we talked about in lecture two, I two or three, uh, the water remaining would then be fractionated or evaporated, and that would plot below the line, the remaining water in the in the cup. Although I again, with my catchment and hill slope data sets, I'd not seen that even in soil water that I'd pump with a suction lysimeter, a porous cup device to get the Vados zone water. So evaporation plots down here. And the reason I'm showing you that is you're gonna see some evaporation data in a minute. And we're gonna look at this watershed. Again, lovely 10 hectare watershed in this, in this uh, catchment that gets about 2,000 or 200 millimeters of water. It's a wet but seasonally dry catchment. These trees are 50 year old Douglas fir trees. Like, a, like sometimes it's called an Oregon pine, but it's a fir tree. And we're gonna now sample these trees to see what their isotope composition looks like. And this is what the data look like. This was first uh, collected and presented to me by uh, Renee Brooks, who's a really uh, an incredible isotope geochemist and ecologist at the Environmental Protection Agency. And she came to coffee one day with these green triangles, only th those data. And those data were quite shocking to me because remember, all the water I'd ever sampled from soil water, trench flow, groundwater, precipitation, of course, stream water, had all fallen on this meteoric waterline. And here she's showing trees that are plotting below the waterline, which is suggesting some kind of evaporation source. So we mounted a sampling campaign to sample soil water, as you can see, going from shallow to deep. And you see the shallow water out here, and then deeper and deeper going progressively back towards this, this line. All my soil water I'd sampled with my suction lysimeters, these porous cup devices that you vacuum down to about 60 inches of mercury, all that water was on the line. These soil water samples, water was extracted from them with a technique called cryo. You heat, cool, heat, cool, and you get every, every uh, bit of water out down to a tension of about 15 megapascals. So this means this is representing all the water, whereas the typical hydrological technique for sampling soil water just gets the, the easy to get mobile water. So what these data are saying is that the trees really aren't using the water we see in the stream. And the water we see in the stream that would fall on this meteor water line aren't, isn't the water that the trees are using. And this was, a, this was really quite a surprise uh, for us. Um, and it really challenges the idea that the subsurface is well mixed because this is suggesting that, oof, 
the subsurface is not well mixed. It's uh, rather compartmentalized in terms of where the, the trees are, are, are getting their water. And if we plot on a, on a plot um, the lysimeter water on the y-axis with that extracted water on the x-axis using this cryogenic extraction technique, almost never do these two pools of water mix. So this is saying that the, the mobile water, the easy to move water, seems to be not blending or mixing or interacting with the cryogenically extracted water. And this cryogenically extracted water is, is always more isotopically depleted, as we might, we might say. I'll talk more about this uh, in a minute. So we needed to come up with a kind of a explanation, and this is our best attempt. And again, you see a picture of the watershed in this, uh, this photo here. It's a wet place, but it's not wet all year. Remember those hydrographs I showed earlier? Uh, there's a gap uh, during the dry season where for two or three months, really there's little if any rainfall. So if we look at the left-hand cartoon, it's saying that after that long dry period, when all the soil water has been used by the plants, the first fall rains seem to recharge that soil water profile, but recharging that more tightly bound water that the trees seem to be tuned into. Then in the middle plot, we have many months of just rain event after rain event. Remember, there's 2,200 millimeters of precipitation. This is a, a wet place. This is a uh, this is wet like, uh, I don't know, Guilin and Yan Shou. If you go down the Li River on a, on a tour, it's a very wet place like that. But then it's got the next dry season comes and the plants then start to transpire because they're not active in the winter. And where do they get their water? They're using water from six months ago in this kind of layer cake fashion. So this was our explanation for this system that has the, the hydrology and the ecology perfectly out of phase, we might say. If they were in phase, we'd, that would mean that the trees are pumping the most water when it was wettest. And here it's the opposite of that. The trees are really transpiring hard when there's no rainfall. I mean, there's water in the soil that was recharged during the wet season in the middle panel, but seemingly very little interaction between that mobile water and the tightly bound water. Now, we didn't really believe this could operate elsewhere, so a PhD student, Havame Ivaristo, uh, did a lovely study where he found in the literature about 50 or so papers that had the data where we could test this hypothesis. So we could pose this, what we're calling eco-hydrological separation, as a null hypothesis to try to reject. And these papers had the soil water data, the plant data, the precipitation data, the data we'd need to see whether or not what we're seeing here in Oregon uh, on the west coast of the United States applied elsewhere. And there were some sites in China as well, as you can see. So this is a so-called meta-analysis, using data from the literature to test a, a hypothesis. And this is the, the test of that. Basically, the mobile water, like the groundwater, like the stream water, and the rainfall or precipitation all falling on that meteoric water line, like all waters that fall from the sky that don't undergo evaporation do. But if we look at the plant water and the soil water, again, the soil water extracted with this cryogenic uh, get all the water out technique, uh, the plants and the soils drift off this line on a lower slope, suggestive of this evaporative fractionation. So this says that, gosh, this mechanism this, that we're kind of illustrating is much more widespread than we might otherwise have thought. So this, this again was a, a, a surprise to us. Um, but how can we quantify this? It kind of, you know, if you uh, squint your eyes, you kind of see that, you know, the plants and the soils drift off the line on a lower slope. How do we quantify that? Well, it's a very simple way, and we, it's called the precipitation offset. And basically, you look at the uh, deuterium and the O18, and you 
simply look at their slope and y-intercept on those lines, the slope and the y-intercept. And here we've al also divided by uh, one standard deviation to represent some kind of measurement uncertainty. So it's a, a very simple model to say basically how, how far off this line are we? Meaning these green samples and these gray samples, how far away from that line where the mobile water sits are they? And that's what this, this very simple equation allows us to do. So here's a plot of what that equation looks like. Here's the offset on the y-axis, and here are the catchments, or the sites, I should say, on the, on the uh, x-axis. And you can see they represent different biomes, arid, Mediterranean, temperate forests, grasslands, even the tropics. And zero would mean they fall on that meteoric water line. And if we look at things like the stream water and groundwater, they're largely on the line. It's messy because it's real data and there's, there's uh, some uh, distribution of samples uh, based on time of sampling, numbers of samples. But you can see that the plant data and the soil water are down, dragged down farther off that line. And this is the way we are able to quantify how far off the line they were using this, this uh, simple technique. So this idea of using tracers for uh, where trees get their water, these data combining the two isotopes, the so-called dual isotope approach, has been very helpful to show things that we wouldn't otherwise have seen with the single isotope. And what, what I'm suggesting is this. This is this eco-hydrological separation or sometimes called the two water worlds hypothesis. And again, it's just a hypothesis. Uh, I, I fully expect that we'll reject this hypothesis in the, the years and decades to come. But these data are fairly compelling because what they're saying is that the rainfall in the stream water looks like this on the line. The stream is that lagged and damp version of the rain input. Remember, we first started looking at this in a, a sinusoidal pattern for a single isotope. And what the plant data is saying, the plants are a lagged and damp version of the soil water. The most shallow soil water is the most evaporated, farthest out on that evaporation slope. And the deepest water doesn't really undergo evaporation because the evaporative uh, signal doesn't penetrate too deeply into the soil uh, profile. And the plants are, are taking some blend of that water. And it's a bit of a can of worms, as we say. I don't know if there's a equivalent saying in Mandarin, uh, but it's a, it's a problem because this opens up some many other problems about assumptions we make, even calculating transit time. One of the hallmarks of the transit time analysis is that the subsurface is well mixed. It's kind of an assumption in the technique. And this is kind of saying that, well, that assumption may be incorrect. Let me just show you one or two uh, last uh, uh, examples of this by other groups before I move to try to wrap up. Uh, there was a paper that came out about five years ago using a rather different method. This was, this was satellite information. Uh, Stephen Good, who's now at Oregon State University and colleagues of his at the uh, University of Utah, published this very nice paper in Science. And they found effectively similar uh, results to us, but again, using this uh, Aura satellite. It measures uh, the deuterium vapor from space, which is a whole different uh, lecture topic. But uh, in order to correct their data and to understand the global mass balance of these data, uh, they found that there was limited connectivity between the soil and surface water that fundamentally st structures the physical and biogeochemical interactions of water transiting through catchments. In other words, things weren't uh, well mixed in the way that they thought they would be, and this influenced the way they had to kind of close their de deuterium vapor uh, mass balance at the, the global scale with this uh, satellite-based measurement. Another paper I think uh, that was interesting, it came out uh, after our findings, was this paper that kind of pointed to two nitrate worlds. And a quote from this paper that came out in 
uh, Ocalosia that I liked. Uh, they sampled soil uh, water uh, and soil extractions, meaning this is the cryogenic extraction technique, getting all the water out. When you do that, it sampled the aerobic, anaerobic microsites inside soil aggregates where denitrification can occur. Whereas lysimeters, that's those porous cup devices that hydrologists use that don't get all the water out, uh, it's more the mobile water, where they found was that the lysimeters largely reflected the transport of N that was nitrified in the aerobic macropore environment or in surface litter. So again, depending on how hard you extract or, or what water you interrogate, not only do you see differences isotopically, you see differences in terms of uh, nitrate concentration. Let me try to wrap up here and tell you about some new and, and future work that might try to bring some of this uh, together. Again, what we've been talking about are the, 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 the transit time uh, through catchments. And I wanna just finish with some examples just to whet your appetite for what can be done. And maybe in your own work or future work, and with Professor Pan, I wanted him to see this in terms of uh, work possibly in uh, China. And uh, in some ways, I, I, I alluded to this, I think maybe in the last lecture during question time, but I just wanna show the data uh, because this work is uh, continuing. And this is from the Luss Plateau. And of course, uh, you all know this better than I do. This is an area that's quite large, about the size of France, that's undergoing this world's largest uh, greening project or afforestation. And as I, I said during the question period uh, last week, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what's being planted are fruit trees and apple trees. And what we're gonna we're look at in this next couple of slides is going after the age of the transpiration. Remember, so far we've just been asking, where are the trees getting their water? Where in the soil profile? We've not asked the question of the, the, the age or transit time. So we're gonna use the tritium technique. This is also a hydrogen isotope, H3, but it's the radioactive one. We've not really talked about it much, but uh, as I might've alluded to in the question period, this is years. Uh, so, you know, probably many of you were born in this range. I was born in this range and here. So when I was uh, in my first few years of, of life, world, tritium concentrations were, were going up very rapidly with thermonuclear testing. This on the y-axis is tritium units uh, getting up to about 6,000 tritium units. It peaked in 1963 and that's because the comprehensive test ban treaty was put in place and ever after that uh, these concentrations came down. Now tritium is not stable, it's radioactive and it's got a half-life of a little over 12 years. What's interesting though in the Liss Plateau is that if we sample, just look at the right-hand side, just this, this plot for now, there's tritium units. It's not going up to 6,000, it's going up to 60, 60, so two orders of magnitude lower. But this is still very high. And in fact, there's 1963, but rather than this plot that you saw, it's now tilted on its side. That's because here's the soil surface, and now we're going down, down, down 20 meters in the profile. So these are soil samples that were taken by auguring from students uh, at uh, Northwest Agriculture and Forestry University. And then this is detecting where that tritium bomb peak is uh, and, and what the, the kind of dispersion of that looks like through the, through the soil profile. Now, we're going to be sampling apples from the apple trees and basically analyzing the tritium concentration of the apple water, assuming that it's come from the soil where the trees are sourcing their water. And these trees, as they age, they're putting roots down uh, very deep, 12, 13, 14 meters, because this is a fairly dry area, not enough moisture to sustain them, so they're doing this kind of one-way mining of water deep, deep, deep down through the loose. Eventually, they can't go any deeper and they die, but uh, 
the trees we used were alive. And this is what it looked like. So here's on the y-axis is the depth down to about 25 meters or so. Here you're seeing some crops, some young trees, older trees, and as they get older, they have deeper roots. And these deeper roots extend through that tritium profile. Remember the tritium is, is peaking at about eight meters, eight meters. And uh, here's eight meters, uh, you know, showing the, it, it's a cartoon in terms of the distribution. But the, the, the punchline here is that in terms of the age of the water, we can use a, a mixing model and we can calculate then the fraction of water sampled by these tree roots at different depths. And it was surprisingly uniform from the, the, the mixing model work that was done by this PhD student at Northwest. Um, and this PhD student at Northwest, who's now a, a young professor at Ludong University, but the apple water was almost 30 years old. So much older than we might have thought from a more typical uh, you know, one or two meter soil profile in a more humid area. So this is uh, some first work to kind of get at what's the age of the water, the transit time, not of the stream water, but of the, the plant water. Now, wrapping up not only this lecture, but uh, the other lectures, we started off talking about, you know, this is our, our challenge. How do, we, how do we understand the stream hydrograph here, as you've seen now many, many times, discharge versus time, and what water is contributing to that stream flow? And not just in time, but in space as well. Where in the catchment is the water coming from? And I think what you've seen today is that now we need to also ask, <laughs> depth-wise, where is that coming from? How does geology affect it? Because you've seen how, how, uh, how greatly rock type affects things. If you have very permeable rock, uh, maybe the water is going to be very old because it's mixing with a much larger tank almost of, uh, of, of uh, kind of a reservoir or filter. Whereas if the water is very low permeability, yeah, maybe everything is moving shallow through the system. And I just wanted to say that, you know, this convolution integral approach where we assumed a, an exponential transit time distribution and we got at a mean transit time, I think is, is uh, changing very quickly. And this is an exciting research area on its own because now there are all kinds of new mathematical approaches, uh, tracking models, even particle tracking models. And what it's enabling us to get at is not only the mean of the transit time uh, distribution, but what the nature of that distribution is and how it might vary through the hydrologic year. And this is a, a really uh, exciting research area because it's getting at what the blend of water is in its ages in the stream and for environmental problems linked to pollution or climate change or land use change or nitrate application, and when you're going to see that express itself in a stream, uh, this, these, these modeling approaches can be very powerful. There's a lot of exciting new work going on in this area. I wanna just uh, leave you though with an example and a grand challenge in our field of catchment hydrology. I showed you this earlier from Luxembourg, this lovely small country in Europe, and these colors were different rock types, and remember the, the more permeable rock type, the sandstone had, was this one up here. My mouse has stopped working, but it's this little tiny dot in the upper left-hand corner. It had the oldest water of about two years. But in this watershed or nearby it, in that same sandstone, there's a brewery that makes beer. And this brewery uh, taps or puts a well down uh, deep into that sandstone and it pumps that water to use to make beer. And believe it or not, that water that is being used to make the beer from the groundwater has been age dated with carbon isotope age dating at 33,000 years old. So this well is uh, roughly 300 meters deep. But look at that age, three, 33,000 years old. That's uh, uh, pre-Holocene water. And look at the age of the water in the stream. It's like uh, a year or two years old. 
that's a big disconnect. There was a lovely paper published by Scott Giusecco, um, uh, now a young professor at UC Santa Barbara, and he looked at uh, groundwater data that also had this carbon isotope uh, age dating data with it. So another meta-analysis. You see some of the basins or some of the groundwater spots were in China, many in Europe, uh, several in North America and the United States. So he, he looked at 6,500 of these wells and he plotted them here. And what, is, what are these data saying? That here's on the y-axis is depth below the surface. So there's zero. And now we're going even farther. Uh, that last example of the brewery that makes the beer, they went down about 300 meters. These data go all the way down to 600 meters. So these are, these are wells that are used for agricultural municipal uh, pumping. But what he found, and for me as a hill slope hydrologist, I found so interesting, is that if you go below about 250 meters, two thirds of that water is going to be fossil water, older than 10,000 years old. And that, I think, illustrates our grand challenge. How can we reconcile these very young waters that are flowing in our streams, relatively young? So back in Horton's day, they would have said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's rainfall, so it's super young, days old, hours old, uh, maybe weeks. With the isotope techniques in recent decades, we know it's varying from, I don't know, one to 10 years old. But the groundwater, the water in storage, uh, is very old, and most of it is, you know, at least below 250 meters, is fossil water, older than 10,000 years. This is a grand challenge, how we're going to come to grips with the water balance and understanding these uh, interactions between water in our flowing streams and the groundwater that's in our, in our systems. And I think it comes back to this diagram and this lovely quote by Keith Bevan that the boundary conditions are of the science. And I think this is very true when you think of transit time that we talked about today and the, the source of water uh, used by uh, vegetation in our systems. And maybe my last slide, this is from a recent review paper by Matthias Springer, uh, a German scientist. And this is a kind of, again, pointing towards the future. And the future is really getting at the, the demographics of water, the age distributions, just like the demographics of a population uh, in China or Canada, where maybe we've got a, a skewed demographic distribution to more young people, or maybe it's maybe uh, more like Japan, where you've got a much higher number of older people. Uh, it's the same thing we can do with water. If we look at water in vegetation or in the root zone or groundwater or surface water, it's kind of thinking about these ages here on the y-axis and how water in our different parts of our system, if you can kind of see this surface water or vegetation water or uh, river or lake water, how can we think about these, these demographic trends, kind of like we do with a population uh, analysis or a census. It's kind of like taking a census of water in our, in our systems. This is a great paper if you're interested in uh, reading it. And uh, I think I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, take any questions you might have. Any comments or questions? while I drink my tea. Yeah, maybe from the students can ask some questions. Yeah. Either by text or if you want to unmute yourself. Maybe Jeff, I have a question. Just so you mentioned the mean re residence time and the mean uh, transit time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this different uh, concept. 
maybe what's the relationship is yeah. negative for the catchment? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, and it's confusing in the literature because as a community we kind of agreed on different terms uh, at different times in our history. So prior to about 2010, yeah. residence time was used to imply transit time. Okay. But if we uh, let me try to draw a picture. And again, I'll, so here's my, here's my uh, best attempt at a, a watershed. So there's the watershed and there's the, the, the subsurface. So we've been talking tonight about the transit time of water and that's the transit time for all the flow paths that, you know, long and short that ultimately lead to what we see in the, in the stream channel. That's transit time that elapsed time from that hitting the soil surface to making its way to the exit or the outflow. Like that simple equation I showed at the very beginning. Residence time is different. Residence time is if we went to a well and we sampled that well at, at one little point in the watershed and we took the sample and we calculated its uh, isotope composition and computed okay. the age of the water right there, that would be residence time. The residence time is the time it, it's sat or it's taken to get to that, uh, to that one point in the system. But the transit time is the, uh, the distribution of all those flow paths that eventually get into the stream and make up the, the, the blend of signals that we see. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the, re the resident time may be focused on the groundwater. And yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But you could also have soil water residence time, I guess, or anything that's taken from a point within that that yeah. distribution of flow paths, we call residence time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, professor, I have a problem. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is the uh, uh, well, uh, I have a chemistry background, so not that high of a hydrologist background. So uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. please excuse me if I ask any unprofessional question. No, no. Um, okay, so for the um, uh, the work done by a wonderful EPA woman, the um, you know yeah. using the suction condensation device, um, yeah, and the the different the 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 uh, the, uh, the the curve with different slope. Uh, yes. by extraction comparing to the mobile water. Um, mm -hmm. So when I look at that, what I uh, think of immediately is the column chromatography that we've, we have been doing. So those are very fine silicon dust and uh, the material we put into the column have affinity with the column material and the okay. wash off is done say if we're using silica then we're use the methanol to wash out those products uh -huh. so the retention time of those products all always have something to do so the damping so we also have a washing curve yeah the damping and also the retention time of that curve also always have to do with the the type of solvent we're using so mm -hmm. I've, I've, uh, what's in my mind is is uh, have any works been done regarding the soil um, chemical composition that might affect the um, well the mean retention time uh, in the hydrological terms? So, uh, yeah, or in other uh, or in other word, uh, have have uh, other chemical tracing uh, mm -hmm. that, that 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 is present in the nature being. Uh, Sorry, have other chemical tracers that is also abundantly present in the nature being used uh, to explain the uh, or consider yeah. to explain that? Yeah, that's a good question. So for the, the transit time analysis at the catchment scale, yes, there have been other chemical tracers used. So chloride, for instance, there was a study published in Nature in 2000, led by Jim Kirshner, and he used chloride concentration in the rainfall. It was a, a site in the United Kingdom, 
near the ocean. So the rain had high chloride naturally. And he followed the chloride through the watershed. And rather than using stable isotopes, he used the chloride data that was available at that watershed. So at that kind of uh, scale or that kind of uh, application, other, some other tracers have been used. Um, but going to your question about extraction or uh, I guess the, the looking at soil water, uh, one issue I think is that a lot of these chemical tracers, you get reaction along the flow path uh, with the grains, the chemistry of the grains that make up the soil. And that's why the stable isotopes have been a preferred method because they don't react geochemically along the flow path. But the isotopes themselves can be upset by chemicals in the water when you do the analysis. So for instance, methanol and ethanol can be a problem for the uh, laser spectrometer that we use to measure the isotope signal because it throws off the, the kind of spectra in this device. So these phenolic uh, compounds we might have to first get rid of or analyze the water in a different way on a on a proper mass spectrometer. Oh, okay. um, so I don't I don't know if that's really answering your question other than yes other approaches or other uh, uh, chemical signatures have been used but they're really seen as inferior to the isotopes because the isotopes are are truly conservative but when we have soils that have high um, phenolic comp compounds like ethanol and methanol, they themselves can be, you know, challenging for some of the analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that, thank you for giving the answer. Um, I'll, I'll check on the chloride uh, part and yeah. Um, just trying to, well, might take a bit longer, a uh, bit of time to fully understand that. Although I've taken the, I've taken this course, or well, some of the content twice. So I'll, yeah. I'll take a look at that. Thank you very well, much. Well, you know, there is, there is a, there is some data you might be interested in. It's all freely available, and fully online, and it's a, uh, it's from this site in the UK. The catchment is called Plin Limon, and there are basically many years of data collected at seven hour intervals. So this is fairly high frequency data. And they basically have sampled the whole periodic table in precipitation and runoff in these streams. So you have the whole periodic table available to you if you wanted to look at it in a project in one of the water security program classes. Uh, that data is available to you and with the chemistry background you have, you might find that quite interesting to look at, at that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Other comments, questions? Hi, Jeff. Hi. Hi. Uh, you know, the, the water pool of the plant that was uh -huh. well mixed, but for the runoff, it is well mixed. So in your opinion, what is the key difference of the, of this, of the, the flow process of those two pools? I guess the, you know, the flow process in the plant is really driven by Ohm's law, meaning tension differences in the plant and in the soil water environment. And that really at the end of the day is determining maybe the amount of water that's drawn up through the plant and also where in the soil the plant is getting its water. It all comes down to matrix potential differences and how that relates to the Ohm's law, OHM, in terms of like a electrical uh, circuit uh, analogy. Whereas the, the transit time, I guess, is more like uh, 
more like Darcy's law <laughs> in terms of uh, flow through the matrix uh, slowly uh, through the system, like the one dimensional example I gave from the Luss Plateau. You know, it, it took uh, almost uh, 55 years or thereabouts to move eight meters. That's, uh, you know, controlled by uh, uh, diffusion and uh, advective dispersive mixing as it moves through the soil profile. So maybe that might, those might be some basic differences between how the biological and non-biological systems behave and, and process water. But again, uh, you know, Darcy's driven by uh, matrix potential gradients, elevational potential uh, plus matrix potential equals the total potential. And that's total potential times the hydraulic conductivity, of course, is the Darcy flux. So they do have many things in common. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> are, are you sampling uh, vegetation isotope composition in your work on the Tibetan plateau? Uh, yes. In the, and, on, the, on the north facing snow, I have a shark. Uh, uh, I have analyzed the sharp, the sharp uh, ice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 where? What does the shrub water look like in terms of the soil water that you sample? Mm. Are you sampling the soil water with cryogenic extraction or a suction lysimeter, or how are you sampling soil water? Uh, there was two, uh, two kind of the soil water. One is the mm, the numster, it's uh, the the mobile water and the bulk water. I was, both, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do they look do they look different? The bulk water and the the uh, lysimeter water. The difference is mm, just like the result you was shown. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh huh. Uh huh. Interesting. Detailed, detailed, detailed result uh, has, has not uh, finished and analyzed. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. You're you're still analyzing samples, I guess. Uh yes, and uh, yeah. I, and now in the Tibet Plateau, you know, I'm uh, measuring the deep holes and the big change now. <laughs> okay. In yes. the deep holes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So the deep holes are on the meteoric waterline, are they? Uh, yeah, in recent days, I was measuring the deep holes. Okay, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Good. Okay. Yes. Great. Well, it'll be great to see that data. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Other questions? or comments? I guess on this or any of the lectures, since this is our last time together. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I have a question on the MTT between uh, the, the the relationship between MTT and uh, impermeable rock, maybe mm -hmm. the I I think your you mean you just give the uh, the understanding on the impermeable rock. You have a high uh, in for the enrichment uh, for the catchment. Maybe if the catch just like like uh, in, in the last battle, maybe the the very high uh, soil layer. And uh, maybe some areas, maybe some the, in the rock between uh, under this on the soil layer. So maybe the soil, uh, just uh, you also, also mentioned the different rock types in the, these areas. Mm -hmm. I want, I'm, I'm wondering what, what's the, uh, What's the difference between the just for the uh, for the soil layer and the, some the soil and 
uh, mixed soil, soil layer and the rock and the impermeable rock that cause the different yeah. elements, uh, the, the upright stream, yeah. I guess, I guess in the end, we're really just talking about how big the storage is. Yeah. So whether it's soil and rock or all soil or all rock, really yeah. it's about how much you can store in that material. So some, for the yeah, yeah, some areas as the outlet, the, the outlet yeah. of the catchment is very just uh, several, maybe two or three meters soil layer. Yeah. 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 That's the, right, and then it, it thickens. Yeah, under this the soil layer is the rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But so, the, the, yeah, but the the up the upslope area has is very very thick. But it's yeah, like a yeah, triang yeah. Triangle comes down to very thin. Yeah, the stream. Yeah. But I would think that that is a bit that if you think of your storage volume as a triangle, so the stream is down here. This yeah. is the the hill slope. That's a big mixing volume. So I would think that the I don't know. The groundwater must be very old. I would think the stream water would be old if the groundwater is sustaining flow outside of rain events, uh, because the you know the the transit time is really the storage divided by the discharge. Yeah. So the, if the storage is really big, then the transit time should be very long. So I guess my my uh, my inclination would be that man, you should have some very old waters on the list plateau. I mean, even look at that tritium data. It took 55 years to go eight meters. Yeah. So it's a, it's a slow process. Yeah. It's a slow process. So, but it'd be very interesting to look at. And there are groups uh, working on the list plateau going after these kinds of uh, questions using tritium, using other uh, techniques. Yeah. Like yeah. Lijia, Lijia yeah. and uh, others, Bing C. I, I yeah. know him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah I, I also want to do some research on the different, uh, the soil, uh, different uh, positions of the catchment. Maybe, yeah. That, yeah, it is a, a changed greatly from the, from the, this uh, position to that, that position and it, from the upslope to the, yeah. Down slow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be uh, that would be interesting. Let me just see if I have a a diagram I could. Because the soil layer they have a great variation. Uh huh. In the soil, yeah, yeah, yeah. Depth in the depths. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And is there is there much variation in the the nature of the loose, or is it pretty uniform in its uh, texture or permeability? Yeah, for, I I found the soil uh, almost the, the very uniform. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just share my screen uh, briefly, if I can. Uh, Want to show you a diagram? Uh, here. Can you see this diagram on the right? Yeah, I can see. So I guess, you know, as we go to the Luss Plateau, yeah. maybe, maybe it's something like this. I don't know. Or maybe not, because you've got Luss over rock. But, you know, this kind of is just illustrating uh, how the blend of water can include some very long old water, you know, years, decades, even centuries or millennia, uh, depending on what the connection ultimately is to the stream. I, and it brings up questions like, where's the bottom of a watershed? You know, often we don't really know that. It's so in our groundwater models, it's kind of determined by the boundary conditions we impose in the groundwater flow model, and that would be that'd be interesting to think about. Um, you know, where on the Lus Plateau is the bottom of the watershed? What's the boundary condition? You know, what's the what's the control actual control volume for defining the flows 
you know, in the, in the list plateau. That would be interesting because you're right. I think if you were to, uh, again, if I try to activate my pointer here, you know, if you were to, uh, I don't know, sample water here or here or here, or even down at different depths, as you say, I think you'd see very different residence times if you sampled the, 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 the uh, soil water or the, the ultimately the groundwater because of the differences in those flow paths. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we, we, it's very hard to, 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 we can get the fluid path for the underground water. So maybe also, we, we, I think uh, maybe for the surface water and the, uh, the ground water, maybe they have, have the different uh, boundary, maybe, especially yeah. for the small, Catchments, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, it, you know, for groundwater, you would put in piezometers that would measure uh, pore pressure, and you would know where they are in terms of their elevation, and you could calculate the hydraulic gradient. In the yeah. unsaturated zone, of course, you can't use piezometers because it's unsaturated. So you need a tensiometer or a device to measure suction or matrix potential. And then you can combine matrix potential with elevational potential to get uh, flow paths. And I guess that's the, the tricky thing. It's, it's uh, difficult to do, especially in deep material. But it would be interesting to kind of, I mean, that's how flow paths are calculated, either in saturated or unsaturated zone. Yeah. Or, tra or tracer additions, uh, that can be another way. But you'd need so much tracer, given how thick your uh, your material is yeah yeah because i also think the for just you, you you for the your last lecture you mentioned yeah. the variable source area for the catchment yeah yeah maybe because in the in the last plateau the soil hill the hill slope is so steep mm -hmm. yeah we cannot get the this is the area for the variable source for the runoff uh, precipitation and the runoff. We cannot mm -hmm. find the where uh, can get the, generate the runoff from the with each storms. So because yeah. this is the Kani and uh, the hill slope is so steep and we cannot get mm -hmm. we cannot grab the the, the source of the Ghani and the, uh, the stream area. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, I guess my first question would be then, what's the runoff ratio? So if you look at the, you know, the total runoff, total rainfall and total runoff for the event, I would, my guess would be the runoff ratio is probably very, very, very small. Yeah. Because if and I, for the very so very deep soil layer and the, almost the, the yeah the, the precipitation can be infiltrated yeah. So probably if the runoff ratio is very 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 small, I don't know the little bit of runoff is probably just coming from around the stream channel. So Maybe, I would probably yeah yeah I would start there and say how much of that runoff ratio can you explain with water falling on the channel or in you know, close proximity to the channel, and then how much how much more area do you need to explain the runoff ratio? Uh, I'm guessing, yeah, your your runoff ratios are are low, and it'd be interesting if you're going into a wet season. Do they increase predictably through a wet season? That can be a way to think about the activation of maybe additional flow paths as antecedent wetness builds and uh, your runoff ratio increases. Yeah, especially for the vegetation has been restored in the, uh, some areas. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in those areas where the vegetation was not restored, you got higher runoff ratios because you had overland flow as well, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. especially for the very, Big, great storms, we can find yeah. the, the, the surface water 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess I guess uh, in your watersheds in the Lus Plateau, is your base flow going down because you are now uh, shutting off a lot of groundwater recharge with the vegetation that's there to trend fire it? Are you finding that? Yeah, but uh, I think for for the various, uh, I just uh, measured uh, some plots, uh, run of plots, and uh, the the big the the area of the plots can uh, reach about uh, uh, six hundred millimeter square millimeters. Just uh, com combine the se several hill slopes and uh, e ephemeral, uh, just a sh uh, shallow gully. Mm -hmm. Combine this uh, very small catchment, mm -hmm. and uh, I found for the this catch this uh, 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 the small catchment just uh, gets a very uh, small run gets a very small run of coefficient. Yeah. Compared with the small uh, small runoff plot, uh huh, yeah, okay, yeah. So I mean, just uh, just uh, the total runoff volume, yeah, is smaller than uh, what is uh, is smaller than uh, runoff plot. But, so but that uh, would tell yeah, that would tell me that you're getting a lot of run on, meaning or not, not you're, you're getting a lot of loss into the LUS even when you have uh, shallow or overland flow. Kind of like that paper by Klaus and Jackson I referred to a couple of lectures ago where the, the, the length of the subsurface flow path, the downslope travel distance as they call it, is really a function of what the permeability contrast is between the, the shallow and the deep. So you've got a very uniform deep permeable system. So even if you do have a short length of overland flow, let's say on a hill slope plot, by the time you aggregate that over a bigger hill slope, it's all going to lose. It's it's going to be lost into the, the deeper um, loss. Do you think that yeah, might explain I don't know. it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's very complicated maybe. Or or very simple. Because uh, the, yeah. the, 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 well, maybe I can just show this one last. I don't want to keep people I, too long. I but. mean, just for the very big uh, area for the wrong, uh -huh. but this area, there's a big, uh, the, 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 the great area of uh -huh. the wrong of slope com combined, uh, com 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 combined. Uh, a, a strand gully, but have a very small uh -huh. uh, runoff. Yes. Compared to a, a smaller uh, runoff plot. Yeah. For a, yeah. For a huge uh, storms. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah. Loss along the flow path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this I encourage you to read this paper. Um, Remember this top uh, diagram, if you can see, see my pointer, uh, see my pointer? I'm, I'm highlighting the top hill slope. Yeah. And this, this is showing this uh, so-called downslope travel distance. So if you have uh, the area in white is high permeability and the area in, in yellow is low permeability, you get a, a long downslope travel distance uh, yeah. because not, not so much goes in. If you have a very permeable uh, subsurface, then you can't get a flow path going very far downslope because it's, it's all seeping in as we go. Kind of this, uh, this idea from my rainstorm, you know, this is water that was uh, flowing during a, an event, but, uh, you're creating overland flow. If you had your runoff plot here, you would say, wow, I had a lot of runoff. But go to the catchment scale, there's no runoff. Because yeah. it all seeped it all seeped in. That's this is what I'm I'm thinking maybe could be uh, perhaps part of what you're seeing. Yeah. 
I, that's interesting. We, I'd love to talk more about that at some point. Yeah, but I think for my uh, round of plot, maybe have no is because the soil layer is so deep. I I think uh -huh. it's yeah we cannot find the the rock in under the soil layers. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe I think the soil layer should be ex should exceed exceed ten or twenty meter meter. Yeah. 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 So incredible. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, thanks for coming to all four of these lectures. And uh, great to see you and, and the group. And, and good luck with things for the rest of the term. Yeah, I think uh, all of us can, be in the, can learn a lot from your lectures. So oh, maybe, yeah, for the next year and um, yeah. um, uh, maybe next semester we can also we all would like also uh, invite you to give a more se lecture series <laughs> on okay. this. yeah 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 all right thank you Great. thank you Jeff. thank you very much yeah. okay bye 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 bye